Hi everyone, Carl Steele here, English 4113, class 21 on Margaret Garner. I'm going to talk about the fugitive slave laws, about some American Christian defenses of slavery, and also the various ways to tell the story of Margaret Garner and what happened with her children and how telling the story and representing it in different ways maybe leads to different understandings of how that story uh, works or what it does politically. So first, the Fugitive Slave Law. You may or may not know that there's a Fugitive Slave Law, at least in the original version of the US Constitution. So anybody who claims to be a constitutional originalist has to talk about this sort of law, right? Of course, US Constitution Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3, no person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping to another, shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. Uh, if you have a state that uh, has legal slavery and another state that has outlawed slavery and a slave person by moving from the slave state to the free state is not going to be liberated, at least according to this law. So the U.S. has this situation of federalism, lots of different states with lots of different laws. And it, the U.S. Constitution says that certainly on the issue of slavery, uh, we could ignore all those local laws or rather that the local law about promoting slavery is the one that actually governs every other state. And so it's not simply about the federal law, but rather about taking the laws of particular states and seeing these laws apply to everyone. Um, so it's really not in terms of federal authority, it's in terms of the power of slave states. So there are attempts to uh, provide more teeth to such laws because people resist it. Um, uh, in the 1790s and then through the first half of the uh, 19th century, culminating in the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. I want to call attention to a few features of this law, which you can read more about by clicking on that link in the PowerPoint. In no trial or hearing under this act shall the testimony of such a lab fugitive be admitted in evidence and the certificates, blah, 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 blah. So this is, what, does, what does this mean? It means that if a Black person uh, who is uh, accused of being uh, escaped property. Um, if they're brought before a judge who is going to try to determine whether or not uh, they, they belong to somebody legally or whether they're a free person, um, that Black person is not going to be able to speak up in defense of themselves. They cannot defend themselves in court at all. They're, nothing they say will be admissible. Um, and we take that in combination with this section eight marshals, deputies, clerks, and special officers to receive their usual fees, commissioners to receive $10 if fugitive is given up to claimant, otherwise $5 to be paid by claimant. So what does this mean? It means that there's a real financial incentive to get a hold of people and, uh, and to say that this person belongs to someone else because um, you get $10, right? Um, and so as you can imagine, this would have inspired uh, basically people or federal authorities or working on behalf of federal authorities to track down, uh, track down or lay their hands on black people, whether they're free or formerly enslaved, and to uh, basically give them over to friendly judges who are then going to give them over to somebody in the South who's going to basically get a uh, bit of free property out of this. Um, Northern state resistance in various ways. They, they pass laws against it, even though the Supreme Court holds that the Fugitive Slave Act is in fact constitutional, and eventually this culminates in the U.S. Civil War. Um, so um, people who are defending the, uh, the, conf the Confederacy and their war against the U.S. government will often say, well, the South was operating in defense of their state's rights. Uh, this is wrong on two, in two ways. One is if you look at the Articles of Confederation, it's clear that uh, the states that were leaving, trying to leave the federal government, we're all doing it so because of their defense of slavery. It's all in, in the Articles of Confederation. That's what they talk about. Secondly, um, the rights of states to outlaw slavery were being trampled on. Uh, the federal government was consistently weighing in on behalf of these slave owning states. So states' rights, that, that problem goes both ways. What happens with Margaret Garner um, is that Margaret Garner is going to be charged uh, being be called an escaped slave by Kentucky and the federal government in the state of Ohio, which is a free state, wants to try her for murder. Um, and so with the goal probably of finding her innocent and then allowing her to uh, continue her escape. She was on her way to Canada when she was found. 
Um, so this is uh, a matter of states' rights. Indeed, Ohio versus uh, the federal government, effectively. Um, now, just to remind you of what happens with Margaret Garner and her situation, um, she and her family make their way across the frozen river from Kentucky into Ohio. They are tracked down and discovered. Her uh, husband tries to hold off the slave catchers with a pistol. Uh, he's not able to keep them at bay. And Margaret Garner, when she sees that hope is lost, takes a butcher knife and kills her, her infant and then tries to kill her other children. She manages to severely wound two of them, uh, and the fourth one is not wounded, but the other two uh, survive. Uh, the infant does not survive. Um, and then she is uh, eventually returned into slavery along with the rest of her family, and, uh, and either she dies in slavery or she drowns herself before uh, on her way back to Kentucky. So it's a little bit unclear because we have different records of different stories of what happens with her. But I also wanted to share this a little bit as kind of a parenthesis about the Christian defense of slavery in this country. So as you're reading through that material from the Fugitive Slave Law and its victims, you're going to encounter this bit. Colonel Chambers, counsel for the slave claimants, that is, he's the lawyer who is uh, speaking up in behalf of the people who are trying to claim Margaret Garner as their property, in his argument, read long extracts from a pamphlet entitled, here it is down here, A Northern Presbyter's Second Letter to Ministers of the Gospels of All Denominations on Slavery. And who is Dr. Lord, who is Nathan Lord of Dartmouth College? Well, I found him talked about here in this book, John R. McKiffigan, The War Against Pro-Slavery Religion, Abolitionism in Northern Churches, 1830 to 1865, which I just found by searching for it in Google Books, and then in archive.org, which has a lot of uh, material that's no longer in copyright. I found Nathan Nord's book itself, the one that's read by the pro-slavery lawyer into the record. Um, Nathan Lord was president of Dartmouth College in New Hampshire from 1828 to 1863. That is, slavery had many defenders in the North, particularly in New York City. And here's what Nathan Lord argues. If God has judged slavery important in his scheme of providence, there is no principle of morals, no doctrine of religion, no interest of the state, no condition of the church, present or perspective, that would not suffer, not from the correction of its abuses, but from its abolition, while the reasons of it continue. It could not cease before its natural period without a derangement whose course and consequences could be calculated only by omniscience and might hasten the general catastrophe of the nations and might produce a wreck of all things. And so I'm just gonna ask you in the Google form, tell me what's wrong with Nathan Lord's reasoning. Uh, I think it's, there's, there's a number of really dreadfully, dreadful mistakes he makes logically, uh, but clearly he's begun with the conclusion, which is that uh, slavery should not be done away with. And then everything he writes is going to be in support of that. And that is part of the problem. Um, so now on to Margaret Garner. Uh, we can find her story told in a variety of ways. Toni Morrison encounters it in a book published in 1973 called The Black Book. And it, it's a collection of various stories about slavery, uh, newspaper accounts. And she uh, is inspired by that to write her novel Beloved in 1987, which is one of the books that helps her get the Nobel Prize in literature. Uh, Steven Weisenberger retells the story in Modern Medea. So he tells something that's much closer to the historical accounts. Uh, Morrison's going to deviate from, from it in various ways. Right? She's not writing his uh, exact story of Garner. She's inspired by it. And then we have Mark Reinhardt in a book, Who Speaks for Margaret Garner, um, which is a collection of primary documents, including, for example, the last recorded interview with Margaret Garner's husband, Robert, and finally, the perhaps dubious recollections of a descendant of Archibald K. Gaines, the man who claimed Margaret and her children as his property. So um, we can find her story told in a variety of ways, and we can find it told in a variety of ways already in the early, uh, in the mid 19th century. So in Harper's Weekly magazine, that comes out of course weekly and is still around in the US, now it's a monthly, um, we can find this bit, the mo modern media. Uh, Medea is a figure you may know from classical mythology. She was uh, associated with Jason. Uh, she helped him out. She had magical powers and they had two children together and then Jason was going to make an advantageous marriage, politically advantageous, and decided to repudiate uh, 
of Medea, who took a revenge on him by murdering the woman he was going to marry, and then also murdering her two children and making sure Jason knew about it before getting in, in a chariot and flying away into the skies because she was kind of a witch. Um, we have a description of the painting on that I'm about to show you, which says that she basically, um, uh, rather finding her children were about to be given up to slavery she'd endured, she seized a knife and took the lives of two of them. Before she could slay the others, she was seized by her horror-stricken but heartless pursuers. After her capture, she sank into speechless stupor, and while being returned to slavery, eluded the watchfulness of her guard and plunged into the Ohio River and found freedom there. This is from 1867, the U.S. Civil War ends in 1865. This is, this, you, you can already see that it differs from the story I just told you. How many of her children did she kill? Where did she die? Did she die in slavery or did she drown herself on the way back into slavery? Uh, this is already a bit muddled. Um, here is the painting that's being talked about. This is an engraving that's based on a photograph by uh, Nathaniel Brady, famous photographer, based on a painting by Thomas Noble. Uh, Thomas Satterwhite Noble is born into, is a white man into a slaveholding family. He fights for the, uh, like for the Southern states against the US government. So he's fighting in defense of slavery. Uh, and thankfully the war uh, ends with the, uh, the slave states defeated by the US government. Uh, he is trained as a painter and uh, makes a number of anti-slavery paintings in the decade or so following the US Civil War. So clearly he had a change of heart politically or at least saw which way the winds were blowing temporarily. Um, so we have here uh, the four slave catchers who are white uh, pointing down. We have two children lying uh, maybe dead here at her feet, two children begging her for their lives maybe or maybe trying to get away from the slave catchers, a little bit unclear, right? This is an interesting ambiguous thing. She's pointing down to them. Uh, they're pointing down to them. She's looking across maybe at this man here and he's looking with horror up here holding a piece of paper, maybe the law in his hands. Um, so we can talk about this painting and also the differences we're gonna see in some versions of it. Um, what actually happened? Now, um, I read an article, Leslie first, the Modern Medea and Race Matters, a art, long article, quite good, on Thomas Noble's Margaret Garner from American Art from 1998. And uh, Leslie Firth quotes, for example, from an 1856 uh, newspaper article that describes the real terror of Margaret Garner's family as she started to kill their children. Simon Garner, Jr., Margaret's husband, sometimes referred to as Robert, fired two rounds from a revolver, and this kept the arresting party off for a while, but it was hopelessly clear that nothing could save the Garners from capture. Suddenly, Margaret Garner seized a butcher knife and turned upon her three-year-old daughter. With swift and terrible force, she hacked at her child's throat. Again and again, she struck until the little girl was almost decapitated. The two Garner men, her husband and father-in-law, began to scream. Unable to bear the horror, they ran wildly about the cabin. Now Margaret Garner turned towards one of her little boys who pleaded piteously with his mother not to kill him. She, nobody in the family is willing to accept what she's doing to them. She called to old Mary Garner, her mother-in-law, mother, help me kill the children. The old women began to wail and wring her, her hands. She ran for refuge under the bed. Finally, the wife of the owner of the house managed to disarm Margaret Garner, who all the while sobbed that she would rather kill every one of her children than have them taken across the river back across the river into slavery. So you'll notice in the painting um, that um, that she's, sorry, that she's uh, she's alone with her children. The rest of her family is not there. The person whose house is, is not there. Uh, the horror is something that she bears entirely on her own. Her husband's not there. Her father-in-law is not there. Her mother-in-law's not there. And the owner of the house is not there. This is a, a pure encounter between Garner and the slave catchers, and also with their children begging, perhaps begging not to be taken back from slavery, perhaps begging not to um, not to be killed. Uh, we can also look at the way the story is told from a newspaper called the Pacific Appeal. Uh, this is from 1862. It's an African-American newspaper published in San Francisco for 18 years, 1862 to 1880. And uh, if, you, if you want to read this, it shows it's a story that concentrates on uh, Robert Garner. By this point, uh, Margaret is dead, uh, but their sons, Tommy and Sammy, are still living. Robert is free. Uh, he, is, he is no longer enslaved in 1862, the Emancipation Proclamation. He's taken advantage of it, and he's gotten away. Um, 
And it's, this really stresses Robert Garner's heroism. They'll remember how Robert Garner stood bravely in the door of his cabin, keeping the deputy marshal and his assistants at bay with his revolver and such other weapons as were within reach while Margaret was slaying her children within her children, not their children, rather than have them dragged back into a life of slavery. A darling daughter was killed and a younger son wounded almost fatally, here just one instead of two, before the brutal hirings of slavery burst in and caught them all. Again, this is written by a, by a black journalist. They are finally carried off and sold south, which means just to literally more like uh, west to east to Kentucky. Robert could have escaped having frequent opportunities, but he would not leave his aged father and mother, whom he, whom he had resolved to free, and so on. A long description, really, that concentrates on Robert's story. So whose story are we going to tell? Uh, what we're going to get in uh, Toni Morrison's novel is a story of a Margaret Garner character, uh, whom she calls Setha, and the story of an unnamed child, the one that she manages to kill. And if, uh, and, and a uh, two-year-old probably uh, who returns as a kind of physical ghost to haunt her uh, and to accuse her of, of what it is she's done to free her. So let me just also then, here's the uh, painted version of uh, the painting, Thomas Satter White Noble's Margaret Garner. Again, I want you to notice the triangles. What he probably has in mind is this painting, the Jacques-Louis David's both of the uh, Haratii from 1784, uh, so he's a French artist, and also these various triangles. This is a story uh, from uh, Roman history where these, uh, rather than have a giant war, it's determined that three sons will fight three heroes of the enemies. And uh, these three sons take the oath to go and defend, defend Rome. Uh, two of them are killed fighting their opponents, but the youngest son manages to separate his opponents and then kill them all individually. So two of these two of these sons die and they manage to be victorious, but at the expense of the loss of uh, two thirds of the family and here are the women of the family weeping. So in class, we can talk about the resonances between these two paintings. Clearly, Noble has this painting in mind when he's doing this one. I think the, the resemblances just in terms of the form are just too clear. This is an extremely famous painting. Um, so finally, this is a drawing that we have by uh, Noble of uh, Margaret Garner, and I want to point out two more things, uh, and we can talk about the differences that this makes to the story of Margaret Garner. Here we still have the four slave catchers. Now we still have Margaret Garner. We're missing the furniture. We're missing the overturned chair. We have two children, three actually, lying dead at her feet. And we have another child begging either to be spared from slavery or begging for his life or begging for the two of them in some ways because they are the same thing. And we have one more object which is never otherwise depicted in uh, Noble's paintings, which is the butcher knife. That's the weapon or the instrument of salvation, never otherwise presented. And why did he take it out in a painting? So this is something we can talk about in class. And thank you so much. And I will see you Tuesday.